Hi, everyone. This is Ben Jackson with the IPA. We're going to give our participants another minute to join the call here, and then we will get started. So please stand by. Hello, everyone. I'm Ben Jackson. I'm the Chief Operating Officer here at the IPA. I want to thank you all for joining us today. We have a very good presentation. And normally, I like to do sort of formal invitation or introductions, rather, of our speaker. But I want to uh, wax a little poetic here because I've known Oddweight for a little while and we've run across each other in the in the industry for years now. And uh, he is the, the founder and chief seer at Data Seers. And he'll talk a little bit through the course of his presentation about what that means and sort of how it is that they approach their work, which has been very interesting and valuable for a lot of companies within the payments industry as they try and keep up with all of the crazy stuff that's going on in the world. And in addition to his technical expertise, the one thing I can tell you about Oddweight is he is a connector. Uh, he is he's good at bringing people together and introducing folks and talking about sort of the big ideas of payment. So some of the examples of that, he's a board member at FinTech Atlanta and at Tech Alpharetta. And so he's always trying to sort of foster that community. And, and what I want to do is encourage you all to put your questions into the chat or into the Q&A and engage in a conversation. Don't be shy about that, certainly. And if there's something that occurs to you afterwards, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, or if you need a connection or if you know Oddweight, don't be shy about reaching out to him because he is very definitely someone who, if he doesn't have an answer, he probably knows a guy who does. So um, with that, let me turn it over to Oddweight to talk about an interesting topic here, which is the the dangers of good marketing. Oddweight. Thank you, Ben, uh, for the kind introduction. And I will be talking about dangers of good marketing. The first thing, obviously, you see on the slide is Chief Seer and Data Seers, which is our marketing, right? Uh, marketing is always about being creative, being gimmicky. So I'm going to take you down this uh, lane of what happens when marketing is too good and what are some of the uh, things that you can avoid and, and, and do the right thing. I have a lot of familiar faces on the attendees list. So uh, thank you all for joining. If you guys have any questions, feel free to interrupt me. I want to make this very informal uh, because webinars can get boring. So I want to keep this interactive. So if you have a question on the slide, I have my chat windows and Q&A is open. So please feel free to uh, stop me and off we go. So a quick disclaimers, I did put this presentation together. I'm using a lot of images. I don't own the copyright data sales, doesn't own the copyright to these images. So whoever owns them, it's either listed or if I don't know it, I don't know it. Uh, and the views in this presentation are my personal views and do not represent the views of the company I work for. All right, quick introduction. So Data Sears uh, is an Atlanta-based B2B SaaS company. We work with a lot of payments folks. We work with a lot of BAS banks and fintechs and processors, and we offer a software solution that helps with compliance, fraud, reconciliation, analytics, and onboarding and I'm the founder and the CEO of the organization. So let's dive right in. So marketing is an art, right? Obviously, everybody knows the most interesting man in the world. A diamond is forever. Just do it and got milk, right? All of these things have made an impact on us as individuals. And we will, every, anytime we see any of these symbols or any of these advertisements, we can associate that to a brand. This is a classic example of great marketing. And the goal of the marketing is really simple, right? It's to attract customers in. Uh, if they don't attract the customers in, then there is no point. I always tell people the, the main difference between sales and marketing because a lot of times people will combine these two together. The job of marketing is to get the person in. The sales team has to then sell the product, right? That's the goal. So if attracting customers is the goal, 
uh, you know, how is, does it work? So let's look at the current state of fintech, right? So obviously we are all in payments here, our banking or fintech, and we want to talk about how marketing and fintech is working together and what's going on in the market today. Let's just admit fintech is on fire every single day. There is some news, something is happening out there. Somebody has raised money. Somebody has become a unicorn. Somebody is offering a new product. I mean, I remember 10, 11 years ago when I was uh, entering this industry, there was no concept of a fintech. Uh, when somebody said prepaid, people were like, what is prepaid? That's meant for the unbanked or the underbanked and who cares? And fast forward 10, 11 years later, everything is running on those rails and all these large banks. I see uh, folks on the call from Bancorp and US Bank and, and all these folks, which is the industry is tremendously exploding and there is no signal or there is no signs of anything slowing down or anything you know, stopping, right? Even if the economy is bad, people are still raising money, still growing and so on and so forth. So what does that mean? If we just focus on the banking-like applications, some of the numbers are right in front of us, right? Chime, 12 million accounts, Sparrow Money, 2.7 million accounts, Ally, 2.2 million accounts, Current, 2.2 million accounts, and so on and so forth. If you look at this metric from insider intelligence, they're showing what the growth is going to be for somebody like a Chime. They're projecting that between 2021 and 2025, they'll basically end up doubling their client base to a 22.7 million customers, right? So this is what's happening in the fintech industry today. Obviously, right? The marketing is great, which is what people is, which is what is getting these people in to the space. But you have to look at one thing, right? The VCs have also been funding these fintech companies based on customer metrics. So the biggest way to get more money from a VC is to have more customers. That's it, have more customers. It is plain and simple as that. As you go and say, okay, I have 10 million customers, it equates to an amount. If you have 1 million customer, it equates to an amount. And as many customers as you can bring in, unlocks the next level, gets you the next level of funding. That's plain and simple as that. If you look at the metric today, the current rate is approximately $100 per customer for funding and $1,000 for valuation. What does that mean? If a fintech has 1 million customers, you know, if you look at it, somewhere around 70 to $100 million in funding, and they're valued at a whopping billion dollars. So here's a, here's a trick, right? Here's a, here's a simple way to become a unicorn. Start a fintech, get a million customers, and you're a unicorn, right? What that means to be seen, whether somebody gets acquired at that value to be seen, but the money is not slowing down. It is directly proportional to the amount of customers somebody has. Now, I heard a metric from somebody very recently. They told me that they are adding a million new accounts a month, a million new accounts a month. That rate, I bet you, is higher than even JP Morgan Chase, right? They, they're not adding those kind of accounts a month. So that's the crazy nature of FinTech that is going on right now. And it's clearly evident. Look at the valuations of some of these giants, which is exactly in line with what we saw before. You know, all these valuation numbers are crazy, which is thousand dollars, right, approximately, in terms of the customer percentages. So if we have established the fact that the easiest way to grow a company is to add more customers. So the entire focus is going to be in adding more customers and hence marketing. So let's talk about what that means. Marketing budgets have skyrocketed, right? So according to Insider, Financial firms have nearly tripled its digital ad spending over the past five years to 24 billion as fintechs prioritize branding. I mean, I have to give a shout out to an amazing fintech here in Atlanta called Greenlight. I'm pretty sure you guys saw last year's or this year's Super Bowl. 
uh, last year's Super Bowl right now, uh, season has already begun. And it says, I'll take it, right? Great advertisement. But that's what's happening is there is so much marketing, so much amazing marketing out there that people are doing and spending billions of dollars in that marketing. Now, what's happening is that at the same time, there is also a need for less friction. Nobody likes friction. If you look at a typical account opening in Europe, we tried to open up a branch in UK. They told us that it will take six months to open up a bank account. Yes, it takes six months for an American to open up a bank account or business bank account in UK. That's typical, right? I mean, they might expedite it, and it might be three months. Same thing in India. Try to open up a bank account. The KYC process is so slow and so painful that it takes months to open up an account. We are the opposite here. In the US, if you look at the amount of time it takes, especially with fintechs, right? It takes approximately 10 to 13 seconds to open up an account online digitally. That's one of the reasons why giants like Revolut and Monzo and N26 gained so much popularity in Europe because traditional banking and traditional players were taking too long to open up the account. So the need for less friction has been there. Make it easy, make it quick. And that's been the number one goal for people to be able to open up accounts. And that's what drives, again, their valuation. So if you look at, it's very common in Europe for them to do their initial KYC, take a photo, take a self uh, of their driver's license or passport, take a selfie. Now they actually have a NFC chip in their driver's license, which you tap behind your phone. It verifies that the information that you have provided is actually matching the information in the NFC chip so that that particular driver's license or passport is not tampered with. That's how much quote unquote friction there is when you open the account in Europe. Whereas here, it's so easy, right? You put in four pieces of information, first name, last name, address, date of birth, last four of your SSN, voila, an account is open. In fact, right here at IPA, a few years ago, I believe it was 2019 pre-COVID, it feels like forever ago, uh, Krebs on security, uh, had, you know, Brian Krebs had a keynote and he showed how easy it is to buy identities on the dark web back in 2019, right? Three years ago, it's become even easier now. And not only that, but as more attacks and more hacks happen, this data is actually more accurate. So just like you guys have a KYC vendor or fintechs have a KYC vendor, there is a KYC vendor on the dark web, which is providing you the raw data and it's telling you that, hey, I've verified this data from 50 different hacks. And so it's going to cost you five cents. So those four pieces of information is no longer enough. Right? It's not enough to use those four pieces of information, which is the CIP process here, and onboard somebody. So what happens here is marketing with these two pieces, right? less friction and getting more customers, is always under pressure. This constant pressure, pressure of advertising, you know, keeping the cost of onboarding lower, right? cost of retention. So the goal is in this industry, to get a customer with the lowest possible money spent out in the market, right? That's the whole idea. So if you can acquire a customer for a CPC of five cents, that would be amazing. It doesn't happen. Uh, in today's day and age, I saw a metric that says it costs $33 to get a customer. The CPC cost, cost per click, which is after an advertisement has served, CPM is, the cost of serving the ad and CPC is cost of when somebody clicks on the ad. So when you see the ad, it costs X amount, but when you click on the ad, it costs more. So this metric that I saw was $33 CPC to get to the right customer. That's how much it's costing for them to get somebody. And then you have to retain them. So marketing doesn't stop with just attracting them, but there's constant communications going on with those customers, right? So are constantly under pressure. And at the same time, marketing and compliance are, are at odds, right? Think about it this way. If you look at FinTech and look at FinTech just being a marketing arm of a bank, 
right? Because banks known for their compliance, not necessarily for their advertising. Advertising is known for their marketing, not an ease of product, not necessarily their compliance. They're always at odds, right? Compliance often slows growth and marketing is act targeted with accelerated growth. Somebody literally makes money the quicker they sign up customers, somebody loses money if you know it, it grows too quickly, right? So they're always fighting this battle of pushing and pulling. And what happens then? Great marketing, less friction, boom. You have bad actors entering your platform because you have made it easy. You're made it easy for everybody, but then the bad actors have now entered into the platform as a result because something's got to give. I've always said this. If you don't let them in, you won't have to chase them around. What does that mean? If you actually have a good onboarding strategy that is in sync with your marketing strategy, you will not end up getting these bad actors through the door. You'll keep the door shut and you'll make sure that only the good people come in. And now your job becomes that much more easier to monitor them, right? So don't let them in. You won't have to chase them around. So sacrifice the ego. I have heard fintechs say this so many times. I talk to so many fintechs and you ask them about fraud, like, ah, we don't have fraud. It's you know, small, less than 1% what we have, right? It's okay. Everybody has some kind of a fraud. It is not something that you have to be afraid of. It's not something that is bad in today's day and age. If you said you don't have fraud, everybody's going to look at you and say, well, you're not smart because you do definitely have fraud, right? It varies. Everybody has fraud. So I always tell these fintechs, sacrifice the ego. If you have something valuable, somebody's going to try to steal it. It's as simple as that. When there is a glass house, somebody's going to try to throw stones at it, literally. And you're going to have to protect your valuables, right? You don't, you don't keep your doors open when you have you know, all these diamonds uh, in the house, right? You lock it. Same way. If you have all these technology, you have all these amazing products, somebody is going to come and take advantage of it. So it's your job to ensure that it's protected. So marketing teams have to work closely with compliance and accept the fact that you are going to be a target. You know, in my entire uh, 11 years of career in this space now, there was only one occasion where I was talking to somebody and uh, the chief compliance officer very specifically said that our launch is delayed. I said, why is the launch delayed? And, and she said that it's delayed because we expect fraud. We know people are going to hit us. They are, we know that they're watching our marketing strategy. They're on a list. So these guys had a waiting list. There were you know, something like 500,000 people on a waiting list to open an account before even the account was opened. And they knew it. They knew that some of the lists that they had, some of the people's name and addresses, they are pre-run it through some kind of a check. And they said, there is fraud. We cannot open the gates yet. The moment we open the gates, it's going to be all this influx of fraud. And then we are going to end up spending money, resources, and so on and so forth. Right? So yes, you're going to have fraud. At some point of time, you're definitely going to have fraud. That's like saying, you know, in today's day and age, if you live in the COVID world, saying I'm not going to get COVID. Ah, the probability is that you're going to get COVID at some point of time, right? That's just the nature of it. Uh, whether it will be severe or not, different story. But at some point of time, somebody's going to get it. And remember one thing, when you're fighting fraud, you have to be right every single time. And they have to be right only once. That's the classic example of a enumeration attack, or a card ping, constantly trying different card numbers, expiration dates, trying, 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 boom, they got the right number. And now they can get in. You have to be right every single time. And this applies to not just card fraud, not just payments fraud, but also applies to cybersecurity. Anybody who is in the payment space has to know that at some point of time, there is going to be an attempt to attack your infrastructure whether it is internal, whether it is external, it's a matter of time. Like I live in Atlanta and they say that if you live in Atlanta at some point of time, you're going to have an accident. It's just 
you know, the probability of you having an accident if you have lived in Atlanta for long is 100%, right? Because somebody's going to come hit you, somebody's, somebody's going to scrap, uh, scratch you, scrape you, whatever. So this is a very important metric that you cannot let your guard down, especially when you're living in today's day and age, when everybody is saying that fraud is on the rise, cyber attacks are on the rise, right? So again, going back to marketing, think about what marketing is technically doing. That's why I said the dangers of good marketing. Fraud is on the rise, cyber attacks are on the rise. Marketing is telling, hey, come to me, come to me, come to me. And these guys are saying, wow, new target. Looks like they're spending a lot of money. They have a lot of money. It's a new target. Let's go do something here. It's natural. And nobody thinks in these terms when they put these campaigns together. They're not prepared. Almost 10 out of 10 times when something bad happens, it's because somebody was not prepared. If you're prepared, your probability of diverting an attack or diverting fraud increases by over 70 to 80%. You're 70 to 80% more likely to catch bad actors and attacks if you are prepared, and obviously you're not. Here is the most common phrase that I have these days. I ask people, do you really know your customer? And people ask me, what do you mean? I said, do you really know your customer? I mean, that's a simple question, right? Do you really know your customer? So let's say, you know, I, I, I'll pick some folks that are on the call here, like Keisha. You know, I met Keisha at an IPA event, um, you know, had drinks with her. So how do I know she's Keisha? Well, I don't. She told me she's Keisha. I think she's Keisha, right? And I can keep going down, right? So she told her friend she's Keisha. A friend from a previous conference knew she's Keisha. Maybe she's Keisha. Well, I don't know. Well, she showed me her driver's license. She's Keisha. Well, does that make her Keisha? Uh, maybe. I don't know, right? Driver's license can be obtained. I didn't run it through a scan. Even if I were to run it through a scan, it could be a really, really good fake, right? So how do I know? Well, do I have to now go to Keisha's mom and dad, take their DNA, take her DNA, match it, then find witnesses who saw Keisha was born at that time to these people? You see how ridiculous this gets, right? So I always ask people the question, do you really know your customer? The answer to that question is, no, you don't. You will never really know your customer. And that's how you have to start thinking. Even with an in-person account opening, right? When a person walks in with a physical ID, the probability that they're a fraudster is low. The probability that they're lying to me is low, right? There's no reason why Keisha would tell me that she's Keisha if she's not, right? There's no way that somebody else would corroborate that answer. So as you start going through this process of elimination, you come to a conclusion that, sure, you know what? I think she's who she says she is, right? But that doesn't happen in an online account opening. You don't have the person. You don't have the witnesses. You don't have anybody around. And with today's technology, it is very easy to create that identity. It is very easy to create that persona to open up an account and walk through and be somebody that you are not. Right. So back in the day, if, if you guys did math, uh, I grew up in India, so I don't know if they teach the same things here, but we used to have these problems, which I, as a kid thought were ridiculous, right? They wanted me to prove one plus one equal to two. Like, how, how do you prove one plus one equal to two? Who told me one plus one equal to two? Why is it not equal to three? Right. Naturally, a question comes to mind as a child that maybe it is three. I don't know. Right. And so the way to prove one plus one equal to two was to actually prove one plus one was not equal to two, uh, equal to two. And you would end up with a ridiculous conclusion if you try to prove one plus one is not equal to true. You would end up with a conclusion, something that says, you know, eventually like four equal to five or three equal to two. And you're like, well, but that can't be true. So my original hypothesis cannot be true. Oh, well, that's why one plus one equal to two, right? That's the process of elimination and the process of proving the opposite wrong, right? That's the concept that we have in KYC. We are never going to know who that customer is, but we have to go through the process of elimination and the probability of that person being that person starts going up. 
So what does that look like? Right? If you look at that process of the digital account opening today, it being simple, right? 10 seconds, 10 to 13 seconds. Does technology exist today to actually prove that the person is who they say they are? Uh, kind of sort of does to a certain extent. We can look at their device. We can look at their photo. We can look at their uh, driver's license, passport, whatever. We can look at all of these things that they have and then try to make a judgment call as to if this person is really who they say they are. Now, there is a challenge with that, right? Is even if you say that that person is who they are and you bring them in, well, you know that that person says they're who they are, but are they a good customer, right? So the second danger starts now. You flooded the gates. You know, it's, it's like if you have been to France and Sean's, you know, it's like the Louis Vuitton shop where everybody's standing in line, lines are three hours long and, you know, nobody's going in and they start letting people in, right? There's no guarantee those people are going to shop. So what's happening to the guy that's, you know, one hour far back, he's getting upset. He's telling the security guard that, listen, I want to buy, I'm going to buy, I'm going to spend $5,000 here, let me in. Well, he's going to wait his line, right? That's how it works. Same thing applies to KYC. Same thing applies to digital onboarding. Don't just get customers, get good ones. You know, you want to make sure that the customers that come in benefit you as an organization, right? So who is a good customer? In today's day and age, right? We talk about a good customer being a customer who stays on the platform for a long time, who is, you know, who is transacting frequently, which means they're a loyal customer and doesn't commit fraud, right? Basic concepts make sense that I want a customer who's going to be there for a while. I want them to use my product, you know, as much as they can, because let's just call a spade a spade. If you are a card company and if you have a card product, every time you swipe your card, you make money. If you're a non-card product, there is money baked into money movement. So as you move money in and out, there might be fees. So again, the general concept is simple, right? The more you use the product, the more money the company makes. And at the end of the day, the whole goal of getting this money in and all these customers behind them is to generate revenue. And so the gen revenue generation happens over a period of time. So, you know, in this case, a lot of times what people don't get is you can only pick two of three, right? People want it cheaper, they want it faster, and they want the best thing ever. Well, can happen. I mean, you guys have seen this before, right? You can get good and cheap, it won't be fast. You can get cheap and fast, but it won't be good. Or you can get fast and good, but it won't be cheap, right? And this is the nature of today's industry is something's got to give, right? There is always a push and a pull. And so you have to be aware of what your goals are, right? Don't make decisions on the fly. Don't be that guy that, oh, I'll deal with it when I get there. No, because fraud will hit you. We had a use case where somebody literally told me that they didn't have any fraud in the month of December, February. They called us and said they had lost $300,000 in ACH fraud. And literally between a month, right? Went from not having fraud to having, oh my God, I have a problem. I got, I got to fix, right? So it's going to happen. So be prepared, but know what is your goal? You want it good and cheap? Do you want fast and good? Do you want fast and cheap? Can do all three. And, and whoever tries to sell you all three is selling you a bag of chips. It just doesn't exist. Average life of a customer. I always ask this question to people. Um, what is the average life of a customer? If you look at it in today's fintech space, the average life of a customer is six months or less. I mean, 11 years ago, when I first did analytics in the prepaid space, the average life of a customer was 90 days. You know, it's still 90 days. I mean, the official metric, somebody did a study and said less than six months. But if you actually look at it, what they're measuring is by the time you open the account and by the time you completely stopped using the account, what, how much time went by? 
Yeah, less than six months. I get it. But let me tell you a scenario. If you are in the tax uh, refund business or a tax refund card business, what happens? All the fraudsters, they will open their account in November and December. They will wait for three months. As soon as tax comes back in, in February, they will move the money. They move on. They don't close the card for another couple of months because they might do one or two more frauds, right? So yeah, six months or less, I'll buy that. But out of that, it's really the 90 days. That's the period when somebody is active. Just think about this metric, 90 days. And in that 90 days, how much money is that customer really making you? So I even did an analytics on that back in the day. And it turns out that average transaction, depending upon how many transactions they do, between three and five dollars. So you make between three and five dollars off of the customer in a span of 90 days. If that's your average and you start pulling out all the edges and the bell curves and all these fancy things and go back to you know, the numbers that I shared with you, uh, people who have 10 million, 12 million, 15 million customers, not all of them are going to be active. Not all of them are going to use the product, right? That's why I always ask them how many actually, how many card active customers. And, and if you're in the space, we say that anybody who is active is a person that has used the product in the last 90 days. And that number varies. It, the number varies through seasonality. The number varies through recency. As different, different patterns climb and, and come down, you will see different things happening, right? So if you just look at that metric, let's just dial that back down and translate it. It costs on an average $33 for a CPC to get a customer interested in you. Then it costs more money after that to go through KYC. Let's just say the cost of KYC was a couple bucks, $35. Then if they are a card customer, you're going to send them a card. If the card is customized, it's going to be more expensive. It's non-customized. It's going to be less expensive. I mean, still, you're talking about a couple bucks there, right? Mailing costs, envelopes, T's and C's printed, all of that. By the time that customer ever uses your application or, or app for the first time, you're 50 bucks in. How many of you guys, right? And, and you can type the answer in, in the chat here because I just want to take a quick poll. How many of you folks have opened up an account with a FinTech but not used it, right? Just to just be curious. Like, I want to see what happens. Like, I want to see what the experience is like. And how many of you have many accounts, but have never used them? Like, gone all the way through, opened the account, got on a card, once maybe used, maybe twice, but less than three times, and then gone, never used it again, right? I would love to hear some answers uh, in the chat, if you guys can type, so that I, I'll see if my, if my metrics are right. A lot of people I've, I've spoken to, 90% of their accounts that they have, they only if they have 10 accounts, they only use one or two. Or chat is showing as disabled. Maybe Ben or Brian can help that. So again, yes to both questions. I mean, again, it's, it's a trick question. <laughs> the answer is yes from all of you guys, right? So you have opened up an account just to see what does the experience look like? You have gotten a card. I mean, I have so many cards here. There was a time when I was working in the industry and there's even a card from way back when, uh, this is an old card, uh, you know, uh, in my, in my, uh, wallet just sitting randomly and Nicole Pullman is on the call. She might recognize this from back in the day or, or the Mio card, which was the very famous card that uh, John might recognize from, you know, back in the day, right? These cards are sitting here. I, I signed them up. This is a printed card, logo, number, everything, but never used, right? Just to, ex to experience it. So if you look at the math, it is $50 almost from with everything said and done to get a customer and you're making three to $5 off of them before they churn. Just do the math. So some of these FinTechs, right? The math becomes every single customer you're onboarding, you're losing money. And this metric is true for majority of the folks. 
majority of the folks. I think I saw Brian would like to answer the question live. So Brian, do you want to join and answer the question? And we, uh, I just wanted to answer the question related to opening up apps and, and accounts and not using them. Um, you're not alone here. I like to test uh, different products out, obviously, and I have a number of uh, accounts kind of littered with five or 10 bucks in them that I should probably be closing down. But, uh, uh, you know, I think that is a phenomenon. If you look at the studies that are out there, especially a lot of young people do similar things as well. Um, they're trying to figure out what works best for them and uh, whether this app is something their other friends are using or is it's the popular app. So um, that resonated with me when you when you brought that up. Cool. Thank you for that. So again, let's go back to that metric. Every single customer that is signing up, the fintech is losing money. Right? That's a very bold statement, I realize this. That's why I said it's my own statement, it's not the views of our company. But that's the truth. Because none of these fintechs are focused on making money, they're focused on getting customers, getting the next round of funding and getting a higher valuation in hopes that somebody is gonna buy them, right? So customer engagement is really important when you start diving down into some specific metrics, frequency of use being a large one. Can I get you to use your card X number of times, right? So obviously most bank accounts from a consumer side don't charge fees these days, right? Everybody's fighting fintechs. Fintechs don't charge fees. So banks are starting to drop fees. But some of us who have been around in this country for a while, either were born here, brought up here, or moved here a while ago, you would remember that the easiest way to avoid a fee on a bank account was swipe your card X number of times, have a ACH coming in, and something else, right? Or we take money out of an ATM somewhere. Um, and that was just a metric uh, to tell you that these activities increase the longevity of an account holder they increase the longevity and, and, the, and the money that you make off of that account holder in a given month, which then offsets the fees of the core that they're running on and, and move on, right? So that's literally how the metric is, is frequency of use, how frequently do you use your card is the right metric to measure on and not the total amount of customers you have. So next time, you know, all of you guys, when you go out and when you ask a fintech, so how many customers do you have? And they tell you, well, I have 20 million customers. Then you say, how many of them actually have used their card in the last 90 days and have been on the platform for more than 90 days? You'll see that number will drop significantly. The next piece of a customer engagement is called as propensity. So propensity is a probability of a customer doing something. So all the marketing teams, right, should be asking this question. What is the probability that my customer will go ahead and, in, and have their salary deposited onto my bank account? Or what is the probability that you'll go to a Starbucks and buy coffee this Thursday, right? Simplistic enough, but that propensity has to be baked in to your marketing campaign saying, when I onboard a customer, when they become a customer, what is the probability that they will stay on my platform for 90 days? Or what is the probability that I will make all my 50 bucks off of them, right? And obviously it's hard to measure that, but there are techniques out there, there are metrics out there to actually go and measure it. Now it makes marketing harder. It doesn't necessarily make it bad, but it makes it harder. So you can't just go and hire a bunch of kids and they go on and they set up Facebook advertisements and LinkedIn advertisements. And you'll see all these advertisements being promoted on Facebook and, and, and LinkedIn. And I don't know, I've never seen one on Twitter, but there probably is. Um, you should go and see the engagement just for the heck of it. Next time you see an advertisement from any of the FinTech, you should go and see the engagement. And you will see that the person who is engaged is completely random, right? There's no relation. They're, they're coming in from a completely different industry area uh, outside of the US maybe, or they're not even a real person, they're using a fake account. And, and that's the, that was the whole basis, right? If you look at 
of the entire Twitter fallout, uh, which Elon Musk was tweeting, how many robots do you guys have? How many fake accounts do you have? How many real accounts do you have? That's a very valid question that marketing should be asking even on the FinTech channels, right? Let that be a lesson to all the good marketing folks out there saying, I have 12 million customers, but I wanna know how many of them were good. So I can start targeting differently. That feedback loop does not exist today. That is, is literally somebody is up on this side, attracting the customers, putting them in a pipeline and the pipeline flows down all the way. And on the other end, there is no way of knowing the customer was good or bad, or are they gonna churn? And then the next thing is segmentation. As you onboard these customers, as you bring them on, as they start using your products, as they start swiping their cards and so on and so forth, you have to understand how to segment them. Uh, I can literally tell you amongst all the people that are on this um, attendee list today, there is going to be at least three to four clusters of individuals who are going to behave distinctly. My behavior is going to be different than that of Brian's and Ben's and Stephanie's or, or uh, Ryan's or Tatiana's or Maria's and so on and so forth, right? So you have to understand who that consumer is, what is the behavior of that consumer, and then target them differently. Majority of the time, that means you have to do an A-B testing, right? You have to see which type of customer is better for me, which obviously means separate campaigns, which also means different types of revenue metrics. You may want to target customers with the lowest cost possible, bring them on for the sake of raising money. You raise money and then churn them and then focus on the people that you make money off of. You know, I'm not saying do that. I'm just saying, that could be a strategy, right? Whereas you can spend less than $33 on getting these customers knowing that they're never gonna use your product. They're never going to make you any money. The goal is not that, the goal is just to show that there is a crowd, right? Think about it this way. The last time your nearest shop opened, it was a balloon shop, it was a restaurant, it was a bar, whatever it was right by your house. What was the first thing that made you go in there? Oh, there were a lot of people there like plain old technique, right? I could give away free, free food, free drinks. I could bring a bunch of my friends, a hundred of my friends and say, hey, just flock by the bar every day for the next 30 days and people will start coming in, right? Simple. You're playing with people's psychology to say that, hey, it must be good. I've seen a lot of people hang out there, right? Same thing in this industry. Hey, we have 12 million customers. We have 15 million customers. We have 50 million customers. Wow, I need to try this out and you try it out, it's not the same. So segmentation is extremely important, which again, uh, I have learned from the best guys in the industry. Uh, Bill Franks is on our board, uh, billfranks.com, I'm gonna give him a shout out because he has written five new books. It's just total five, uh, five books. His recent book uh, was published and he has written about how to do marketing and how to target, right? So again, let's recap, I'm gonna, quickly wrap up here. I want to give people enough time to go have a bio break before their four o'clock meetings. I know everybody's uh, back to back. So quick recap here. Good marketing starts with a good strategy. The strategy needs to be around not getting more customers, but getting good customers. Marketing has to work very closely with compliance to align what they both are looking for. If you're going to spend $33 CPC to acquire a customer, you can spend $5 to check them if they are right. Because you may not earn all the $33 back, but you won't at least lose more money, right? So by the time, if your onboarding cost is 50 bucks, spend that extra money, do a good onboarding, make sure you check everything out and don't ignore fraud. Fraud's gonna be there, it's part of life, it's here to stay, it's gonna be with us. You know, it's a matter of time before you get it, right? Just like COVID, it's reality. Now it's happening, people get it, it's around, it's going to be around and somebody's gonna get it at some point of time, no matter how much precautions you take, right? It's just the probabilistic number that you're gonna get it. Same thing, look at fraud the same way, right? Accept it, openly accept it saying, yep, I'm aware, I'm gonna do this, it's gonna happen. And then focus your marketing energy and your marketing dollars accordingly so that that marketing can be a truly good marketing and the dangers of the good marketing actually becomes good lessons learned from marketing. So all the marketing folks are out there um, 
I urge you to go read a lot of these good things that are happening in the industry and, and, and take action. So uh, that's all I had to say. Thank you very much. Uh, if you guys have any questions, my email address is up here. Uh, website's up here. Follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, pick it and uh, send me any questions. If you're shy to ask here, I would love to talk to you offline. I will be at Money 2020. So if you're there, grab me and we can have a chat. And I will open it up for any questions. Uh, if you guys have any questions, please let me know. I, I have one. You mentioned earlier about how uh, financial institutions and their partners need to be right every time and the fraudster only needs to be right once. Um, how does that message, have you had, you know, the, the opportunity to share that thought with law enforcement in that, or kind of third parties, um, you know, who write about um, the industry and write about fraud, because there seems to be this perception that, um, again, we're not doing everything we can to kind of protect customers from this type of onslaught. But at the same time, you know, one bad incident can blow up in your face. And trying to explain to them there are millions of hits some of these companies are taking and one happened to get through because again there's this is the fraudsters full-time job correct um it's it's funny you ask that question i always educate people on this which is why i said the first thing accept that fraud is okay it's i'm not saying that you should have fraud but i'm saying having fraud is part of life so just be okay with the fact that it's going to be there so don't look at it negatively just look at it as it's there I got to deal with it. It's a problem I have, right? Like, um, you know, Alcoholic Anonymous, if somebody goes there and says, well, first way to solve the problem is admit that you have a problem. Otherwise, you'll never be able to solve the problem. The second thing is that, you know, yes, this is so true that the fraudsters, I mean, some of these guys think in ways that people with PhDs that you know, we have on staff and out there who have written some amazing algorithms can't think of, right? It's, and they come up with a stupid, simple way of doing it, which tells you that that's their job. I mean, some of these people, if they used their brain to do something good, they would be better than many of us out there, but they don't, right? They get a kick out of doing something, you know, bad. And sometimes when I read these articles and look at how these things happened, it's just like, wow. You know, it's impossible to even comprehend this, right? It's so simple. It's literally they're going under your nose when you're not watching. That's like that little kid sneaking something from the fridge in the middle of the night when mom and dad are asleep, right? And you're like, no matter how much technology you have, you have cameras here, you have beeped here, this, that, that. They're going to figure it out if they want it, right? That's what they want. They're going to go for it. They're going to grab it. They're going to run away with it. And that's the reality of the matter. So yes, these guys are spending hours and days and technology. I mean, we think we have AI, right? Look at some of these young kids that can that have AI. I mean, just for fun, uh, if some of you guys have free time, go and just watch the Bitcoin core. Just look at how many transactions go through. It will blow your mind away and look at the size of some of these wallets and how that, that happens, right? It's just impossible. Like these kids are so smart. People are moving money in a, such a smart way that you just feel helpless. So we admit that we are always going to be behind, right? There is no such thing as, right? So, so in antivirus, right? I'll give you this analogy and I'll stop is in antivirus world, we look at antivirus. What is an antivirus? How does the antivirus work? An antivirus works, it tells you when you get the virus, right? So when we say fraud detection, we detect when fraud has happened. Now, can we do fraud prevention? So IDS, intrusion detection, IPS, intrusion prevention. But what happens with intrusion prevention? If you are tasked with preventing an intrusion, you're always going to end up hurting somebody good. So the simplest example is if a neurosurgeon is doing surgery on a brain tumor, he's always going to end up getting some good cells out just to be safe. That's the nature of the business. So when you're trying to get the bad guys, we're going to get some good guys out. Same thing with intrusion prevention. When you're preventing an intrusion, you're being attacked from everywhere and you are attacking back or you're trying to save something 
somebody's going to get hurt, somebody's going to get hit, right? It's nature of the business. So in order to avoid that, how much damage are you willing to take? Knowing that you don't have nearly the amount of time, nearly the amount of technology, and nearly the amount of money to do something like this, right? The fraudsters don't have money, but what they have is time. We don't have time, but neither we have the money because time is money, right? It's, it's literally money. So the odds are against us. They are, have been against us. They will be against us. Nobody can come up with technology that's going to stop this because the target is going to keep moving. Interesting. So some of the banks in India typically issue three cards when you open up an account for each account holder, an ATM card, a debit card, and a credit card. What do you think of the purpose of this when one card can do all the work? Um, sometimes, right, it's different interchange. Um, I think the idea here is, uh, you know, uh, Ben, would you like to answer that question? Oh, no. Okay. So it's, it's coming in as uh, somebody would like to answer the question live. So um, there's many, many different reasons why somebody would do that, right? It's one is convenience, one is interchange, one is network, like the goal. Remember, the bank's goal is to allow you to do the transactions by spending the least amount of money and by making the most amount of money. So if I were, if I was not able to get the affiliations, if I have a MasterCard in my hand and it goes over Maestro and I can't sign up with AllPoint, I know that AllPoint is going to give me the best rate. Maybe I give you another card, which just says it's AllPoint, but maybe it's on Visa. I don't know, right? So there could be many reasons like that where somebody might give you two or three cards, uh, which is, I've heard this for the first time. I've never known. I don't know. Maybe our audience has seen this before that banks will give you different cards for different purposes. I mean, credit card and debit card, I get it. But an ATM card, a debit card, you know, that's a that's a tough one. Or maybe acceptance rates, right? Something's going on a prepaid bin, something's going on a debit bin, and prepaid bins are not accepted in many places. Who knows? Any other questions before we break out and give you guys a time to go get a bio break before four o'clock meeting? Cool. Uh, thank you all for attending this event. And if you guys are going to be in uh, Money 2020, please let us know. Uh, I will be there. If not, I hope to see you at the IPA event next year for sure. Uh, and bye for now. Thank you. Thank you, Adway, for presenting. No problem. My pleasure.